morning. Good morning. Good morning. Right now, I'm really nervous, so I'm sorry. I'm not usually this nervous, but Ed and Alandria made me nervous. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't usually do anything this early in the morning, but nothing also this, I don't know, somehow I feel like uh, this is very consequential. So hopefully um, you'll think I have something to say, and maybe some of you haven't heard some of it, and hopefully it'll get us talking about some things. So, um, I wanted to start out with why I'm an economist. I actually became an economist later in life, it's about my third career, I think. Um, I started out in literature and journalism, and I was also an elementary school teacher. And, um, but in the end, the things I always wanted to really talk about was economic inequality and how we get around that. And I realized that the only way to really talk about it was to have a better handle on economics. Because um, I didn't really have the language I didn't really, I felt like mainstream economics had a stranglehold on our possibilities. I didn't really have the language to figure out how we get around it. So I thought maybe if I got trained in economics, that would make a difference. And I really believe that we're not going to make progress, especially economic progress. So I don't sense I'm an economic determinist. We can't make any progress if we don't make economic progress. Um, and my anthropologist brother hates when I say I'm an economic determinist. And of course, he's a culturalist. But anyway, <laughs> um, I don't think we can really make economic progress in the 21st century if our humanitarian values and ethics aren't, and our ecological priorities aren't connected to what we do for a living, right? And so I think more and more of us are understanding that there are limitations and consequences to both human exploitation and the exploitation of our natural resources. I'm not sure how much longer we can go on exploiting both of those. And so it seems it behooves me that we need to really sit down and figure out what to do to, to, to get past that. And obviously all of you are people who are interested in that, otherwise you probably wouldn't be here though not all of you are such economic determinists as I am. <laughs> um, so one of the first problems I realized, probably before I studied economics, but certainly while I was studying it, is that mainstream economics even has the wrong definition of economics, right? When I sat in my first economics class, they talked about economics as scarcity, that we have to manage scarce resources, that that's what it's all about. Basically, that means it's a zero-sum game, right? You have limited resources and thus limited distributional options. And there have to be winners and losers. Well, none of that actually makes sense, right? Why should there have to be winners and losers? What about if we went back to the old definition of economics and then eventually I realized it was also the solidarity economy, which economics, which comes into it. But the old definition was really about home management, right? Economics is really the study of human relationships, processes and institutions as they relate to production, service, and commerce. Can you guys hear me in the back? Am I okay? Mm -hmm. All right. And economics is really a social science, right? When I started learning it, they were acting like it was a natural science, you know, like physics, which after the laws, right? Like, like gravity, if you drop something, it has to fall, right? But economics is not actually a natural science. It's a social science. What's a social science? It's about behavior and people working together. And so, of course it's about financial institutions, it's about trade, right, exchange, it's about production, but it's really about, first it's about human social reproduction, that's the home management part, right? How we reproduce ourselves with children and family and home life and then community, right? And then how we feed ourselves store for the future, and then how we uh, barter and exchange what we have for what we don't have, that kind of thing. And all that is about how we relate to each other socially, and yet, as I said, in the economics field, that's not what you talk about. In fact, you try to abstract from that. Um, that's one of the other things I learned. Luckily, I chose to go to a, not luckily, I <coughs> deliberately chose to go to a school that taught political economy, not just mainstream neoclassical economics. And one of the things we, we learned is that 
economists try to pretend that they're detached observers, when we also know that that's not possible and that's not true either, right? And that if we could just calculate it through a math formula, that then we can predict everything about the economy. And of course, that's not true either, but that's the way that economists are taught to think and to operate. So obviously, there's something wrong with all that. So I chose to study political economy, because at least political economy goes back to some of the roots of what an economy is, but it also adds the dimension of power and power relations, and how that connects to our economic choices. So for me, political economy is about the interactions between and among the economic activity and um, the people, institutions, socio-political relationships that surround that economic activity. So power and economics, race, gender, inequality, right? Political economy is actually trying to understand how economies are born and sustained, why they take on the kinds of relationships they take on, and what happens in terms of who has the power to do what and when does it get exerted and that kind of stuff. And so we see economy as a tool, right? It's actually an instrument so that we can achieve social reproduction and trade production and trade, etc. But also so that we can achieve quality of life. And the economy is supposed to facilitate prosperity, right? Can I say that one again? Because I think in this world, right, it's the opposite, right? An economy is supposed to facilitate prosperity. So what is going on? If it's supposed to facilitate prosperity, then it's actually a tool. But what happens to a tool? How it's wielded depends on who's holding it. And so that's, right, that's really the question, right? Who gets to choose? what tool we use, what kind of economy we have, who wields that, that instrument, and how does it get used, right? We can actually choose the economy we want to, or we should be able to choose it, right? We don't have to have one forced on us. There's no natural law about how an economy has to work, even though the mainstream economists say there is. We have the economy we have because the people in power have the most resources, want this kind of economy. <coughs> It's that simple, though they try to make it sound like it's not that simple, right? In fact, I've heard economists talk about how everything will collapse if we try to do something that's different from what they say we're supposed to do, right? But that's, we know because we see on the local level when people do stuff that everything doesn't collapse, <coughs> but they pretend that it will collapse because that's also the way they get us, right? They say, well, we know, we're the ones who are trained, we understand how these things work, and we're telling you they have to work this way, and if you don't do that, then you're doomed. And so then we all cower back and say, oh gosh, we can't do that. Let's regroup and see what we can do given their paradigm, right? So we've got to figure out how to get away from that paradigm. So my aim is to figure out economies that are transformative, liberating, democratic, equitable, based on human dignity, rather than being limiting, oppressive, and reinforcing of archaic hierarchies and inequalities. How do we do that? We need to first break that mythology, right? Which is partly why I got trained, but obviously you don't have to be trained to break that mythology. But for me, I wanted to really understand the origins and the pieces of that mythology, but I, and I wanted to learn, as I said, the language that they use, so I could use similar language back to explain why those, these other models, these alternatives could work. We have to keep trying, practicing and trying alternatives and experimenting, right? Um, if human history is nothing else, it's, it's a series of experiments, right? and all kinds of different living and trying and whatever. So we shouldn't be afraid of those experiments. So obviously we have to try to figure out how to make them sustainable in the world that's basically run by capitalism and exploitative power. So the other piece that political economy has helped me with is this notion of people, right? And that people are the center of change, right? We have to be informed and proactive, but we're the agents of change. We're also the agents of economic activity, as I said before. 
And if we see a role for ourselves and see ourselves as part of the change process, then that's the first step because most of the time we see that we think that we can't make the change and we can't impact anything. Again, you guys are people who already have tried or try or think you're trying. So I'm not trying to say you're not in that group. I'm just trying to, uh, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to build an argument about how I got to where I am. So I have only five minutes left, so I'll hurry. I'll make it faster. <laughs> so I started to think about what would democratic community economics look like? people-centered, local economic development, community-based and controlled, collaborative, democratically and broadly owned and governed, basically a solidarity economy, which when I first started thinking about this, I didn't have the words for. Um, we need community members to see that they can, they don't actually have to have finance capital, though of course it would be nice, right? But we can use energy and willingness to work together with an un unconventional and alternative resources. And again, if you look through society, people who've had to survive, that's what they do. But it's always been small scale, tiny, and often, um, uh, what do you call it, under attack, right? So we've got to figure out how to keep doing these things, get them bigger, and protect ourselves from those attacks. And make it our primary economy, our primary way that we do it. So, I had a while back in thinking about what I am now, what I call uh, an economic ecology of care and community. And I kind of forgotten about it as I was finishing the book on black co-ops and getting, um, spending most of my focus on talking about um, subaltern cooperative economic development and how communities of color and low income people can do co-ops. But Ed's invitation to come and talk today and to try to talk about something a little different reminded me about this economic ecology of care and community. So if care and community is our base, right, and by care and community I mean we want prosperous communities, but we want humane prosperous communities, right, what would the economic ecology look like? And I wanted ecology not just because of the sustainability, environmental notion of ecology, but remember the notion of ecology is actually a whole system, right? So I wanted us to think about what would a whole system of care and community look like. And I think about the, um, the visions of a Chancellor Williams, I don't know if you know him, an historian, African historian. He said communal African societies were an economy that demonstrates care for all. Fannie Lou Hamer, some of you have heard me talk about her. She has a speech on co-op ownership and in there she says co-op ownership because that would help benefit and develop the total community. Right, and Du Bois has a million different quotes, but some of his favorite terms are about us becoming pioneer servants of the common good through our economy, through our economic activity, that we could create a self-supporting cooperative economy <coughs> that would wheel the majority of our people into an impregnable economic phalanx, meaning we'd no longer be exploitable because we would be able to control our own economy in a way that would insulate us from exploitation. So that, to me, are the sort of the founding principles of some kind of ecology of care and community. Um, we could start listing all the values. You guys probably know all these already. We need common, humane, social, and economic values that are just, non-exploitative, democratic participation, diversity, equity, ecological sustainability, dignity of work, Visibility of invisible productivity, that's one of the problems of the mainstream economy. There's so much productivity that's invisible and undervalued um, in the mainstream economy. We need to raise those up, right? Make them visible and value um, the, those that have been undervalued. We need, obviously, democratic control of capital, collective ownership, and as I said, you can add more. So I want to end on two things. One, when I think of prosperity, and wealth, I also <coughs> started studying wealth inequality, and one of the issues that came out is that we actually are much poorer in wealth than we even are in income, which is pretty bad, because you know most of us, people of color and low income people are low in income, but we're really low in wealth. Mm -hmm. But this notion of a solidarity economy, an economy of caring community, means that there's some collective wealth 
that can make us all prosperous without us having to own things separately. Mm -hmm. And so I've been trying to figure out how we conceptualize that, how we talk about it, how we measure it. So I've been talking about community wealth, some kind of community level wealth building um, that's about the way we pool our resources and share um, the prosperity. Um, I'm trying to look, I did have a, a definition somewhere. Collective assets of a community, pooled resources that give groups of people some economic stability, relative independence, and the ability to help one another. It's joint ownership as a stepping stone to any kind of individual or household wealth, but more importantly, joint ownership as an end in itself to help democratically, to be democratically governed, jointly owned community assets. And so if we, um, in our co-ops or in our other community organizations, if we, <coughs> if we think of the things that we do together jointly and the things that we create together jointly as wealth, and if those projects and that local community economic activity gives us some economic stability and some prosperity, then we're all wealthy. We don't necessarily need to have that vacation home somewhere or a million dollars in the bank, right? Um, that kind of thing. And so I'm also trying to get us to think about how we change the notion of wealth so that we operate there better. And so my, my last idea I want to leave you with, because I think I'm almost out of time, is to me we need to start with young people. I think that um, all this stuff, thinking about reconceptualizing what an economy is, what are the elements, how to humanize the economy, how to think about community well, um, if we don't get young people starting kindergarten, but definitely by middle school and high school, they need to know what a co-op is and what collective ownership is. They need to be working together instead of always being told to you know, work on their own. Right, right now, we believe in collective work and responsibility, right? But a child gets penalized for conferring with their neighbor yes. to find the answer on a test or yeah. something, right? Yes. Um, and yet, how do we most of us do our work is by talking to each other and talking things out, right? So somehow we've got to change the paradigm of how young people interact in this world, not just with their knowledge base, but how they interact economically. If we can get them by middle school to be owning their own co-ops together, <laughs> Creating co-ops that are solving a need for themselves or their community mm -hmm. or their locality so they understand that you can look at a need, create something that will address that need, and that thing that you can create will be something that's a joint project that will actually also bring in some income and some kind of wealth in addition to all this other um, uh, experience that you'll get. Because remember, in a co-op, right, you have to learn how to read the books and you need to use communication to market, so you learn all kinds of math and writing and speaking skills. All the knowledge that they're trying to shove down your throat in school makes more sense because it's applied to something that you're doing that's both helping your community and helping yourself. You engage with adults, right? And if young people are involved in it, then usually you can get their families to get involved, right? So that's another way to bring adults in, not just the adults who are helping the young people. And by the time they're adults, they've already created things, they already know how to run a co-op, they already know how to handle money and make money, they already have some communal wealth, they already have relationships. And so, you know, my ideal is why not, you know, then the moon, right, after that. So, uh, just to leave you, so I think we need to really be, uh, that's where I feel like some of our energies need to go. I'm just, yes. I have a done sign, so I'm just going to leave you with my last sentence, if I can find it. Oh, so, economics can be liberatory rather than exploitative, and it's our duty to make them so. Woo!